This is day four, and our lesson is all about life in the nuclear age. The nuclear age began first at Amos Lanzo Stagg Field at the University of Chicago with the first chain reaction created there, and then the Manhattan Project, and then, just a few years later, the development of the awful atomic bomb, which we used twice, our August 6th and August 8th of 1945, first in Hiroshima and then in Nagasaki, Japan. Soon thereafter, the war ended, and I suppose the war began inside us. Here's today's lesson. The dangers that we fear may exceed the fears that we have. In terms of student objective, I, include, I encourage you to consider what makes you afraid in our society these days for your safety. And what are you doing about these fears? And what actions have you taken privately or in society? Now, after the atomic bomb, America and the world quickly became aware of what enormous power there was in this weapon. And we shortly thereafter became terribly afraid of it. How did that fear manifest? Well, quickly after the war, the Russians got the atomic bomb through espionage and through some of their own science, and so too did other nations of the world. But it was the Russian-U.S. atomic Cold War that really was the acquisition of these bombs. They built missiles, we built bombs. We built bombs, they built missiles. It went on and on and on. And we were stockpiling these deadly weapons. And for a while, the 1950s, families were afraid for their own lives. And they were building fallout shelters in their basements or in their backyards. And civil defense, recently having been activated for the war, was ready to store food and water in public buildings and in underground storage facilities to protect us should the bomb come out. These were dark ages in which to live and there was also the danger of fallout. The Soviet Union developed what they called the Tsar Bomb, and this Tsar Bomb was originally scheduled to be 100 megatons. Now let's look back at the bomb that we dropped in Hiroshima, August 6th. It was about 15 kilotons, the equivalent of about 15,000 tons of TNT. The Tsar bomb and some of the bombs we dropped later were not thousands of tons, they were millions of tons. The Soviets had resolved they were going to do this 100 megaton 100 million tons. But scientists around the world warned them and warned the world in general that if they did, it would likely cause a nuclear winter, it would likely have all sorts of uh, fallout effects of radioactive material, so they decided to drop its size back in half. They exploded the largest device ever, a 50 megaton device. You can go to YouTube and I'll give you the link to see that. Now think about this. America in this nuclear age, it continues into the 21st century, has nuclear weapons on submarines that are cruising all around the world at every hour. These submarines, I think, have two missiles each on them. And the weapon warhead in those missiles are about 30 megatons, orders of magnitude greater than the terrible damage at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Now, <clears throat> there was so much we didn't know about the bombs, and so much we didn't know about what it would do to us in terms of irradiation. In 1951, for example, universities came up with the idea of creating food radiation for the purpose of killing germs. And if, in fact, you take a steak <coughs> or any kind of food, and you wrap it airtight, evacuate it, and you irradiate it, you will not make it radioactive, but what you do is you will kill all the bacteria. You could take one of those steaks that have been irradiated, put it on the shelf of your dormitory, 
move it back and forth to your house every single summer, bring it back senior year, and say to one of your friends, hey, how about those steaks? Let's have those steaks. Open them up, and it would be perfectly fine. But people were afraid of food irradiation. Now, actually, the food goes to the International Space Station, and other food used in the military is irradiated for food safety. But there were science fiction writers who were writing stories about what would happen as a result of radiation. There was a wonderfully crazy movie called Them. It was a film that was set out in the desert, and it hypothesized this, that these giant ants, the size of railroad cars, came as a result of genetic mutations after the desert had been bombed in the tests after the war. Now, it makes for great science fiction, but it is just that. I will tell you one story that is true, though. There was a movie made in the early 1950s called The Conqueror. It was a movie that starred John Wayne and Susan Hayward and was directed by Dick Powell and Agnes Moorhead was in the cast. It was a fine cast. It was a lousy movie. If you can imagine John Wayne playing Genghis Khan. The film was shot in St. George, Utah. It was shot out in the desert. And unfortunately, St. George, Utah is a short distance from the Nevada Proving Grounds where all of these bombs were detonated back in the late 40s and early 50s. And as a result, there was radioactive material all over the desert. About 50 people who participated in that film died of cancer, including John Wayne and Susan Hayward and Dick Powell and Agnes Moorhead and countless other members of the cast. The dangers of nuclear radiation were real, and that's why we finally put a ban on atmospheric tests. It was a strange time. Now, we have seen here in this class, as we've begun the period, the film Duck and Cover. This was meant to be an instructional film for public school children to tell them what to do in the case of nuclear attack. Now, I can tell you, duck and cover in the case of a nuclear attack would do little, very little. In fact, in Hiroshima, there's something called the atomic shadows. There were people who were on the street when that bomb was detonated, and it was detonated a couple of thousand uh, meters in the air for maximum spread capacity of the blast. Some of those people were vaporized and carbon shadows, all that was left of them, are still there in some of the streets for people to see. A terrible weapon. We used it, and I think that we've regretted it ever since. It has driven us. It has driven our foreign policy. It has driven our military policy in all sorts of terrible and perverse ways since the first atomic attack. Now, what happened? <clears throat> what happened is, as you might imagine, <clears throat> there were a certain number of people who were anxious to know what was going on in the Manhattan Project, and there were spies. Klaus Fuchs, F-U-C-H, was a British subject who was over there in the desert working with the Manhattan Project, and he, it turns out, was a Russian spy. Now, because he was a British subject, after he was apprehended, he was taken back to England, for adjudication. He served about 10 years in the penitentiary and thereafter was released. There were two Americans who were charged. One of the most important spy cases was the instance of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. They worked out there at the Manhattan Project and it turns out they were involved somehow in this trail of responsibility getting nuclear secrets to the Soviets. They went to trial, both were convicted, Obviously, Ethel was not going to testify against Julius, and she had a constitutional protection not to testify. The court was not so understanding. The jury was not so understanding. They convicted both, despite the fact there was very little evidence against Ethel. Both were executed by means of the electric chair, and it was a terrible death. They died, and they died minutes apart without ever having contact, just being in nearby screened cages. Now, the Rosenbergs had two children, two sons, 
who later came to learn that in fact their father had done some spying. As it turns out, the kinds of secrets or information he provided the Soviets was not very important and they had already had it from other sources. But it was one of those instances and it is kind of a stain, I think, on America that we had such fear of the nuclear age and such fear of betrayal that we would execute husband and wife in those cases. There's another case I want to mention to you, the case of Milo Radulovic. Milo Radulovic was Serbian by heritage and he was in the U.S. Air Force Reserve during the war. He came out as captain, eventually stayed active in the reserves, was promoted to major. Now, you must know that Serbia was one of the eight provinces of Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia was a fiercely independent, although communist-leading and very independent sort of communist organization, uh, state, if you will, with these provinces. Radulovic had charges brought against him in secret, in an envelope, never disclosed to him or anyone else, and he was going to be denied his promotion to major, and he was going to be thrown out of the Air Force Reserve. Now, a very enterprising and very brave uh, newsman, Edward R. Murrow, heard of this. Murrow followed up on this, drove his crew, and they found out that the Air Force would not issue any of the details. And all that was alleged about Radulovic is that his father and his sister both read Serbian language newspapers. And those newspapers were from a fraternal organization. They weren't political in the least part, in the least bit. Edward R. Murrow called the Air Force's bluff. He brought this material to the attention of the public. The public was suitably outraged, and Radulovic got his promotion, and the phony charges against him were dropped. There are several lessons here. The lesson of the Rosenbergs, the lesson of Radulovic. These are lessons from the atomic age. I can tell you that we are still in the atomic age in the 21st century, because America, the Soviets, and other nations of the world have stockpiled these awful weapons and the only reason we haven't used them, despite the fact that there have been unsettling circumstances, is because of something called mutually assured destruction, powerfully illustrated in the 1965 film uh, Dr. Strangelove. <clears throat> mutually assured destruction means if you push the button, we will, and we will all die. And that's how powerful the weapons are, and that's how many weapons there are. What we need, what you need to do in your generation, is decide what we shall do with these atomic weapons, because this is part of the cruel heritage of the American 20th century. So that concludes today's little lesson, and thank you very much, and we'll move on to another lesson right after this.